Great. So if I could invite uh, my uh, panel to uh, join me. Oh, the order's slightly different, so we'll do it in this order. So um, Andrew, Andrew Whittle, uh, Professor of Civil Environmental Engineering at MIT. I think come into this one here. That would be great. Uh, Nusha Gailey, uh, co-founder of uh, Bybot, if you come next. Diane uh, Hoskins, CEO of Gensler. And we think that Nig Nigel Jacob is caught in traffic, unless he's in here. <laughs> Seems to be the caught in traffic. It's like la late in the office, dear. It's kind of, you know, strange thing. But anyway, so, um, but that's fantastic. Wonderful panel. Um, and, and I'm going to switch it around a bit. Andrew, I'm going to start with you. Um, okay. If that's all right. Very good. Am I, am I switched on? Can people hear me? Yeah. So, uh, again, this whole world of uh, urban sensing is, you know, we started with very simple thoughts and applications, and now it seems to be almost everything can be sniffed, measured, worked out, and all the rest of it. Uh, you've been involved in this world for some while. Yes. Interesting to see what your thoughts are on what's okay. emerging uh, uh, in terms of both the technology and the applications. Yes, uh, okay. Um, so sensors are everywhere. We've got pervasive sensing. You, you heard about uh, using cell phones a lot. We also have pervasive remote sensing from satellites. Um, we have many other means to detect things through drones and so on. Through, there are many platforms to make detection. Um, my world has sort of revolved around everything that's underground as, as an infrastructure. And it's an infrastructure you forget about most of the time. I was very happy to hear in the last session about transit systems because as a big plug, I think that's extremely important uh, in the future. But um, for me, one of the areas that really struck me is that we have buried much of our infrastructure, and we will continue to bury much of our infrastructure to make the city available to the rest of us. We forget about what we bury. Um, water pipes, fiber optic cables, you name it. So I got involved in one problem that seemed to me had been ignored for a very long time, which is that pipes burst periodically, they flood city streets, they cause lots of disruption. This happens in cities all around the world. It happens regularly. Sometimes it happens quite catastrophically. Just last week, we had a flood outside Mass General Hospital, which shut off access to the hospital for emergency vehicles. So these things are really very common. What's exciting about this as a civil engineer to discover is that no one actually monitors the pipes under our cities. I couldn't quite believe this when I first realized this was the situation. And we set about um, trying to figure out if we could make detections of events happening in water pipes under our cities. And the first event of interest was, of course, pipe bursting. Because a pipe bursts underground, you don't know about it until quite some time later when there's a big hole in the ground and a car has fallen in the hole. The time frame between the event occurring and catastrophe is quite long. It's hours. It could be even days. So our detection systems we realized that to do this, you've got to detect across a network of pipes concurrently all the time. So the challenge is how do you do this? And how many sensors do you need? To answer the question at the start of the session, you need quite a lot of sensors. At this point, we've installed and instrumented the entire water supply system of Singapore with about 1,000 sensors to give you a sense of the scale of this. This started just 10 years ago as a small project at MIT and is grown into a, a very successful commercial endeavor. So I'd say that we can do this, and we have to monitor continuously. This is an example of data coming in from all of these sensors continuously. The advantage of this is you learn. The whole system learns. It becomes more intelligent over time. Our detection capabilities go up. But it's a reactive system. It reacts because event occurs, and then we do something very quickly. We send somebody out there to fix the leak, the burst that's just occurred. Having done this, we realized we've opened up a whole can of, of interesting problems related to water. The first one, of course, is, is water health, public health. We're most concerned about um, drinking water being drinkable. There's a lot of cities in this world where the water is not drinkable because of contamination. And it's not contamination at the water treatment plant. It's contamination you pick up through the pipes going through the city. So immediately you could turn around and say, well, this is interesting. How would we do business about this? This is where some of the problems and some of the challenges of urban sensing come, in, come about, because there is a standard framework for everyone checking public health. There are standard regulations, and they're built around sampling, testing offline, and reporting back on a certain statistical basis. But the technology is far removed from that. We could do online sensing for things very much more quickly. 
and the regulation is far behind. So how do you persuade people to move to new modalities to reduce risks of public health? And of course, this comes out very strongly in events recently in the US. We had this tragedy of um, lead in the water supply in Flint, Michigan, but there was also a related tragedy of people getting legionellosis from the water supply, which was just not detected until people have reported to hospital and are critically ill. So there are many things we could do. The technology is there and the, the costs make sense, but we're still not there in terms of the regulation allowing this to occur and to change the modality. Very interesting problems too in other parts of the world. In South Asia, water supply, it should, should be 24-7. Everyone should have access to clean water. There's not a single city in South Asia which has 24-hour water supply. That relates to the fact the pipes are so leaky that you can't pressurize them. If you pressurize them, all you do is pour water into the ground. So it's a real challenge to come up with tactics and sensing that will enable you to figure out smart ways to improve water supply in other parts of the world. So that's one big area I've worked on, and it's got many, many different facets. The other area I wanted to mention underground is, is relates to big urban construction. There's no doubt about it, mass transit is the future of most cities. And that we have to confront this because we have to deal with big construction. Here in Boston, we've been burned by big construction. The big dig really disrupted the city and put people off making sensible investments in transit for many, many years. It's a huge problem for us. One of the challenges that relates to sensing is the ability to construct without causing a lot of damage to your neighbors and risking safety and so on. So we've been involved very heavily in the structural health monitoring during construction. During construction is the phase when things are most vulnerable. And if you can track this and automate those processes, that's also incredibly helpful uh, enabling construction in the city. And so here we are sitting in Boston. The red line doesn't connect to the blue line. It's only 500 meters or something. And it's going to take all the willpower of all the city of Boston to make that 500 meter connection, something that's almost trivial by a construction standard. But at least on the sensing side, we could assure people that this can, could be controlled. So there's lots of advantages. So there's just two, two cases I'm very closely involved in. Thank you very much indeed. Uh, very interesting. And I think we're going to draw further uh, from your water experience as we uh, look at uh, sewage systems, etc. Delighted to be joined by Nusha uh, Geli, who's a co-founder of Bybot Analytics, which came out of um, time spent in, uh, uh, in a, uh, a sensible city uh, lab. So you're being fascinated by sensors and you're now doing some applications. So interested both in maybe one or two of your broader insights mm. about the urban sensing agenda and then specific work that you're involved in. Yeah, so when, when I think about urban sensing and when I was at the lab, this is the way I, I talked about urban sensing was you have two types, one being opportunistic sensing, whereas the other is active sensing. Uh, so in opportunistic sensing, we're tapping into you know, the five billion gigabytes of data that we're generating every day. So the data that our cell phones are generating, these digital footprints that, that we're leaving um, with everything that we do. Everything we do is leaving a digital trace. <clears throat> so there's opportunistic sensing like that, but then there's active sensing, which is like the Underworlds project that Priyanka showed, and also the City Scanner project, where we're uh, designing sensors specific to, to answering certain questions and much of what um, Andrew was just talking about. And so with Underworlds and with the work that we do at Biobot, it's really an active sensing uh, application but it's also opportunistic in the sense that we're generating all this data every single day as humans. Um, we use the toilet, we're peeing, uh, we're flushing the toilet, and this huge and rich source of information is just collecting in our sewer systems, uh, an infrastructure that's owned and managed and maintained by cities, but that nobody's really looking at. So on the underworld side, when we were in the lab, um, we were, it was really about building out the, the infrastructure and the technology pipeline to be able to uh, even um, you know, mine this information. But then once we spun it out into a company, uh, we really needed to go to these cities that we wanted to work with, so government officials mostly, public health officials, and ask them, what are your biggest public health concerns? What 
what would be important for you to see? What data can we present to you that is um, useful and helpful and ultimately enables you to make better decisions? And uh, the majority of the folks we spoke to were here in, in the US uh, and we got the opioid epidemic across the board. Our biggest public health concern is opioid consumption. And so we really design the system around that specific application. So our platform right now at BioBot is measuring primarily opioids and other illicit drugs to really help uh, public health officials make better planning and intervention decisions on, uh, uh, with respect to what types of drugs are most commonly consumed, where in the city um, they see consumption that they didn't uh, know otherwise. Um, but also the ability to track uh, treatment therapies like methadone and suboxone, how are they actually entering into our communities. So this sensing opportunity is, is one that wasn't tapped into before and, and these types of technologies are really allowing us to make better urban management decisions like that. And I can get more into Biobot mm. in the discussion. No, that's a great start. I thank you very much uh, uh, indeed for that. And again, throws up all sorts of questions and issues we'll, we'll come back to when we've just heard from Diane, Diane Hoskins, CEO of Gensler. I think you were also, I think you were an MIT trained architect, is that right? And now uh, with Gensler, a big architectural practice and consulting firm. So sensors fit into the world within which you are operating? In what ways and what sort of thoughts and outlooks have you got? Yeah, um, well, thank you, Peter. And I want to just uh, thank World Economic Forum at MIT for convening this incredible conversation, a really important conversation. Um, you know, I was at MIT earlier in the week uh, with, I had on an oversight committee for the architecture school. And it was really interesting. It was kind of a parallel conversation, um, looking at the intersection of design and architecture and the new college of computing that is such an important part of, of some of the direction of MIT and how AI is really going to start to emerge in all of the various areas of study. But what was fascinating was how it's, it's a complicated conversation, even right here at MIT. Um, and so it needs the kind of diversity of this kind of community around the table uh, because it's important for all of us to be looking at, at all of these issues uh, through the various lenses to really achieve the solutions that are going to matter. You know, I want to start with where the, um, the mayor of Calgary ended up, which was so well said. Actually, all the mayors were amazing, and thank you for setting the table for all of us with the challenges and issues that, that you spoke about. Um, but the mayor of Calgary said, um, you know, if, it, if it's not going to enhance and better the lives of people, then you know, we have to ask ourselves, why are we doing it? So why do we need the sensors, or why do we need fill in the blank? And you know, at the end of the day, uh, in our architecture practice, uh, we, we focus on and, and really have kind of, I would say, put a, a greater focus on the fact that, that we are designing for people and that it's all about enhancing the human experience. And you would say in some ways, well, why does an architecture firm need to say that or need to bring that to focus? But it's really about reminding ourselves of a mission that we have, that, it, that we stand at this intersection of, of tremendous change with urbanization and technology and what's going on in the environment um, and what's going on with changes in how people live their lives. And so how do we create the places the new places and maybe the old places that are going to enhance the lives of people. Um, you know, in fact, we have started our own research institute because of the dramatic changes that are, are around us and that need to uh, you know, come to bear in our solutions in the built environment. And you know, we've talked a bit about things that are going on below the surface that are so vital. And, and so we look at a lot of what is going on you know, above the surface, you know, the buildings, the airports, the retail spaces, the workspaces, really looking at sustainability, mobility, work, and, and really livability. You know, a great example is sustainability and how sensor technology has really allowed us to address those issues in a way 
that goes beyond what we were doing in the 70s and 80s. So, you know, with the energy crisis, I guess it was in the late 70s, cities all over um, mandated certain reductions in energy. And uh, buildings and building technology responded with solutions that did exactly that. They used less energy um, because, again, this was something that was so important to reduce energy consumption. Well, what did the technology do to respond to that in the level of knowledge that we had at that time was actually to reduce the amount of external refreshed air into our, our HVAC systems. So basically, you're recycling the air within the building. It's a lot less energy intensive to do that because the air already is at the right temperature. But what that did and the consequences of that was create something we call sick, sick building syndrome and everyone's heard of Legionnaire's disease and other diseases that frankly were invented by having these hermetically sealed buildings. So fast forward today where we have sensors that we're using in our buildings to monitor temperature, monitor where people are, monitoring also the levels of fresh air intake that are ideal for human performance. We know now what those levels need to be. And designing buildings, uh, you know, we just finished a building uh, in Pittsburgh for PNC. And again, PNC, if you don't know, is a bank here in the United States. And one of the, it has as its mission to be a leader, not a follower in terms of sustainability. And it's a building that actually breathes. It lets in fresh air, uh, again, based on sensors, based on understanding what's going on with the building and the, air t the temperature of the air, but also the human factor. Also, what is the ideal amount of fresh air in the space for work, for alertness? We know all of those, those um, uh, uh, metrics now. We know that students learn better when there's fresh air in the space. We know that health outcomes are better when there's fresh air in the space. So marrying what we know about the needs of people in terms of all the outcomes, the positive outcomes, along with what we can do in terms of sensors bringing knowledge to us about conditions, and then marrying those is really, that's what we believe is, is, the, is, is the goal. It's not just about optimization. Again, we saw what optimization did when we said, let's optimize energy. It was bad for the human beings in the buildings. And you know, again, at the same time, you can't have a 30-story building where everyone is opening the, opening the windows whenever they want. Because again, you're not going to have systems that are going to be able to work efficiently. So how do we now, with the sensor technology that we have, be able to now solve those complex problems that really are finding that optimization of both questions, what's right for people and what's right for the systems that we're operating, the energy we're using, the resources that we're using. You know, when we go to the question of mobility, and it was a great panel, and I think all of the relevant questions were put on the table, but as designers and architects, we're also looking at what are we going to do with all these parking structures that exist in our cities today? You know, how do we change and adapt those parking structures? In fact, today, uh, we're talking to the developers that are you know, building for projects that are going to you know, be open in a 18 months or two years. Yes, they need parking. But how do you create those structures so that they can be adapted in the future for other uses? Well, actually, it means that you have to have flat slabs. You can't have the continuous ramp, which is frankly more efficient if you're just looking at parking as, as the, the issue you're trying to solve for. You also need to have higher slab to slab sizes to be able to get all of the necessary mechanic, mechanical systems and electrical systems into the, the spaces. So again, in fact, I was meeting with a developer here in Boston yesterday, and they were saying, we're actually building and designing our, our parking structure so that it has that reuse potential. It costs more to do that, but at the end of the day, we need to really be looking at how do we optimize for more than one question as we design space today. 
Okay. And the other major question is, and I think it was brought up wonderfully, the curb. You know, again, the, the limited amount of curb that any building has in front of it and the thought of, of everyone using that to, to disembark and to embark at you know, peak rush hour is something that, that we are starting to look at. We're starting to look at visualizations around where does the, the drop off need to happen? Maybe that's what the parking structure starts to be. But you know, again, how do we use design to solve these problems and not, again, look at one problem about mobility and another problem about how do we design? How do we do that together? And you know, just to throw in, additionally, we are looking at work, workplaces and what's happening with work. And you may say, wow, why is, why is that relevant? Well, people spend more of their waking hours in the workplace than they do even in their own homes. And so again, we've done a great deal of research around the workplace and the changes in the workplace. And by the way, a lot of the traffic that we're seeing outside the door is yes, because populations are growing, but also because density of workers within every workplace has actually gone down substantially. It used to be, or density's gone up, square footage per person has gone down. It used to be 250 square feet per person in terms of utilization of workplace. Now it's closer to 135 square feet per person. Well, that means more people are coming to every building. And you know, again, cities need to also look at what's happening in the workplace as a driver for what is actually happening in terms of the demand, the density demand in our buildings. You know, again, a simple um, change one could make to try to decrease traffic would be to actually have regulation around square feet per person in any city. No city's doing that, I'm not recommending that, but there are many things going on that are driving the demand for our streets and the demand for mobility that are outside of what are kind of the obvious and apparent issues. Let's also talk about retail. And again, we've done a lot of research on what's happening with retail. We all know about the Amazon effect and the fact that a lot of stores are closing. Well, the other side of this is a lot of digital uh, commerce is now coming into bricks and mortar because they realize that's a better way to engage with their, their customers. So now we're starting to see more demand for store space, especially now that store space is less costly because the demand has gone down. So the, the complexity of all of these factors from the standpoint of how people use cities is also driving the kinds of, of changes we all need to consider. And the sensors and the data is actually going to help us to find solutions that optimize for both and not just one of those systems alone. Thank you very much for that. Uh, very interesting. I'm uh, having some interesting questions coming in, which I'm just going to uh, pass across and see, uh, see thoughts. Uh, I mean, one of the interesting things is someone's asked, uh, does urban sensing guarantee an increased transparency of infrastructure systems for the public. So we got this information. Uh, it could be used by a water company or whatever to fix some water. But are you seeing sensing also being used to actually help people have a greater? Well, can I, can I have, a, have a go? Because I do a lot of work or have done a lot of work with public agencies. And most groups that have data are very how should we say, possessive of their data, right. not very big into sharing data. Um, and this is actually sometimes quite problematic. Um, for a number of years, I, I wore a hat as a, uh, on, on the board of directors for the Massachusetts Department of Transportation. And of course, as a Department of Transportation, they gather a huge amount of data on where buses are in the system. It took an enormous amount to persuade people that if they handed that data over, other people would develop applications so that you'd know where buses were. But when they did, it was like this giant relief. It was like, why, why were they ever holding this data back? Um, so sometimes persuading people that sharing data is extremely useful. Um, but the truth is, for many cities and many places, different agencies hang on to data, sometimes with a sort of security blanket in mind. We sit on a corner here, which I, I talked about pipe burst, but I'm amused because there was a time when people would tell me water supply wasn't a security issue. 
I mean, they would say things to me like, oh, well, this is something where everyone can share this data. But actually, since 9-11 probably, and since our changed world, everybody is worried about these things. And so data isn't shared very freely. So although there's more and more data out there, I find more and more of it's locked away by individual agencies. And finding ways to share that or share the knowledge can be very important. Um, it could be as simple as one utility dealing with its neighbors. Uh, the classic example uh, in my history was uh, when we worked in London a few years ago where um, Thames water is required not to leak water under the city of London. And the subway people, the London Transport, were complaining that they had to turn their pumps on all the time to pump water away. And they could never figure out why they had so much water. Of course, it's coming from the leaked water pipes. Um, if only the two agencies had talked, they might have actually found where the leaking water pipes were rather than worrying about how much they were paying for pumping. So the sharing of data between organizations is something which is very problematic in many cities. Mm. Uh, you want to, yeah. I, I'd, I'll answer that question with a, from a slightly different perspective. So what we find is that um, being able to tap into an infrastructure like wastewater in order to understand population health um, so an infrastructure that everybody's contributing to is actually an opportunity to count everybody. Um, it's an opportunity to design services that are applicable to everyone, not just those who happen to come into contact with healthcare services, for example. Um, I'll actually use a statistic that I wrote down here that I heard yesterday. So the, for example, the, the Massachusetts Department of Public Health estimates that about 4% of people in Massachusetts suffer from opioid use disorder. Now that's just over 300,000 people, um, given the population of Massachusetts. Now in 2018, almost 2,000 people died from an opioid overdose. So that's the data that is being looked at. It doesn't matter how you slice and dice and model and visualize that data, that data does not represent 99% of people who suffer from opioid use disorder. Mm -hmm. So how then are we as healthcare providers or government agencies or public health departments, um, how are we equipped, we're not best equipped to deliver the right services and the right programs to people. So in a way, I think um, some types of sensing technologies are bringing about this democratization of, of counting people and collecting information from everyone in in a, a equal way. So no, you're not just listening to the voice that is speaking the loudest. Um, mm. So that's one angle there, yeah. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. And yeah, I mean, you know, again, speaking more from looking at what's going on inside of buildings and that data that is being collected. We just finished um, a building in China. There are over 600 sensors in the building. And there is a massive amount of data being collected about where people are, and again, a lot of things going on related to um, the energy and, and water usage systems. Um, and that's only one side of it. There are other uh, parts of this. In fact, I think WeWork has been fairly uh, famous for saying that they have a huge amount of data really looking at how people work. And they're not the only ones. We have many of our, our clients who are uh, large corporations who are putting in sensors into their workplaces to really understand more about how people work within their environments. And in fact, we have a client who is setting up a living lab where that data is going into a, a feedback loop so that they know how to make adjustments in real time to their workplaces. Do any of them want that data to be shared? No. Um, there really is a sense that you know, this data is part of their own strategic advantage and, and to be used to, to help advance their objectives. Um, so I, I think there's, you know, there's data that really, at the end of the day, is, is being seen as um, por part of a company's uh, strategy now. And, and even not, you know, gee, we want to know how much energy, but really, how do we optimize what we do every day to be successful and, and uh, grow our company? I, I just, I mean, are you getting a general sense that as a, uh, as society, as c c citizens, we're, we're just kind of coming to accept that 
um, all sorts of things. There are sensors doing almost everything. Goodness no, in my, in my, in my travel from dinner on my, on, in my Uber, goodness knows what data I released on that journey. I mean, is it just, I'm just interested, is this just the, you know, accept it, it's, 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 it's helpful to someone, uh, get on with it, you know, don't worry, it doesn't hurt you. I, I'm just interested as whether there, there is some kind of generalized acceptance that, yeah, you know, and, and it's great because it gives me, makes me feel more safe and all the rest of it and various things, or do you think there's somehow going to be a, a pushback, a, uh, there's something we're, we're slipping into a sinister world of surveillance and sensing that, that citizens might at some point say, hang on a minute, well, I'm, I just, the, I'm just interested in... The, the, um, again, it was, I think the mayor of Calgary was yeah. talking about the project in, in Toronto, Toronto um, that Sidewalk Labs is doing. It really, I think it has to do with there being conversation and engagement around mm. this question. And, and I think that makes all the difference, um, whether it feels like it's something that is where I'm a victim or I'm, I'm kind of getting something of benefit and it's an exchange. Mm -hmm. and, um, and I do think that's probably the area that could really be exploited much more um, because I do right. sense that there's a little bit more going into one direction of that than the other. Yeah, I, yeah, I absolutely agree. And I think um, as our sensing capabilities become more and more robust and more advanced. Um, it's even more important to sit, have all the stakeholders at the table. So that's including technologists, urban planners, architects, government, and all levels of government, I think. So um, as a part of my role with BioBot, I do all the government uh, engagement. And so it's not just mayors and, and cities, but it's also state legislators. It's also at the federal level. Um, and then community groups. Uh, how, how do we include the voice of citizens? And, and I'm actually originally from Toronto, so I've been following what, what's been happening with Sidewalk very closely. And, and I think um, it's very important from the onset to have everybody around the table and design that implementation of this new technology together, rather than a technology kind of centric view. Because it's also not what we're just sensing, but it's then what, uh, how are you programming the algorithm mm -hmm. to interpret? And, you know, there may be all sorts of biases um, uh, that we feed in there, which mean that we then are making policy making decisions based on some input of an assumption or whatever into the, uh, you know, the honest output of the sensor then goes through a, a whole set of uh, interesting processes. So presumably that side is, is quite significant as well. Andrew, do you Absolutely. want to comment on that? I've, I've been cautious about saying anything because, I mean, clearly there are huge invasions of privacy um, between our cell phones and, and the transportation people relies so much on the data for origin destination to do all of our transportation planning. Yeah. And frankly, you'd like to be able to target that to individuals to know where the, the barn really is. So there's a, there's a real pressure to get more targeted sensing data on individuals and individual behavior, but it's clearly at a price. So I think you're absolutely right. This is, there's bound to be a pushback on this uh, and how this data gets used. I can't say it's somewhere I've had, I mean, I'm monitoring inanimate things, <laughs> and I'm probably grateful for it, and I'm aggregating data. There's a lot of other sensing we could use. One thing that hasn't come up in this conversation, I mean, I dropped in the word remote sensing. I mean, you know, we have abilities to look at city scale at things that we never dreamt of before. We've got so many satellites passing over our cities. There are sources of information that we're just not tapping into at the moment on sensing capability um, that really will change, but will anonymize somehow the use because, you know, seeing mobility and people moving in cities can be monitored from space, but not at the level of the individual cell phone. And I think there are definitely advantages to looking at other technologies that, that, that right. are becoming more useful, so. You know, to that, that point about the algorithm, you know, the data does not create the algorithm. And, uh, you know, we, as I mentioned, you know, we started our own research institute. You know, we're an architecture and design firm, but we're also a research institute. 
Because we are looking at not just what we can observe through a sensor, but also through engagement with people, mm -hmm. both ethnographic work as well as survey work. And again, coming back year after year, looking at how things are changing and starting to try to connect the dots around these complex issues of how people use space, how people work, how people shop, how people use airports, uh, sports facilities, all of these types of things. So it's not the data that is dictating outcomes. It actually is data helping us to understand how to enhance those experiences. Because mm. mm. I wonder in the conversation, you know, ultimately, uh, transparency and or honesty are quite a good thing. Uh, in other fields, I mean, uh, for example, I'm doing work around circular economy and textiles, and suddenly we've right. we've shown a light on this entire infrastructure of the the, the fashion, clothes, textile industry, and thinking, "Wow, is this is this is this how this system works? Is this the amount of waste? Is this the amount of blah 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 blah?" And, and I'm just, it's it's just interesting over time, it seems to have all sorts of utility to these sensors and all the rest of it, but whether there may come a, a moment of, of reckoning when we actually say, is this, this, this is the sort of society we want to be in? And, and I'm just intrigued as to whether or whether, hey, it gives us lots of benefits, so we carry on. So I'm just interested whether there's going to be a, a nasty pinch, pinch point when the, when the spotlight is really shown what aspects of my urban life are sensed and for what reason? And I'm yeah. just naive at the moment because I don't know. I mean, I think not to go down the rabbit hole too much, but we're, that's sort of happened with the whole Facebook and Cambridge Analytica yeah. fiasco. Um, and I think at least from our side, we're, our company's just over a year old. We were fortunate enough to be able to embed, um, embed, uh, you know, values of privacy and transparency in the company from the beginning. And, and I hope moving forward, all tech companies, all data companies, I mean, all companies really that are working um, within the public realm are, are kind of taking these values and, and really learning from what we saw happen up until uh, about a year ago. Mm. Yeah. yeah, yeah. I, I'm just going to pick up on this on on the the related theme, of course, of cybersecurity. When you you have all these sensors out there doing things, Diane described very particularly in buildings, they're 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 not just monitoring; they're controlling. So if you if you provide control systems with elaborate sensor technology, which is vulnerable to being hacked, you're also taking very big risks uh, in the use the use of sensors out there. And obviously, trying to find ways to secure those systems is a very big deal. Mm. And we've had one big example and recently. I was trying to think the the case with, with cybersecurity, where a whole bunch of these control systems went down last week. So, right. So, um, mm. so, it's, so it is a huge issue. For yeah, them. Diane, did you? Want no, I, I loved the fact that you brought up the circular economy. I think this is one of the most important concepts that we're going to be talking more and more about, mm. using that kind of language and. You know, in the case of, of buildings and the built environment, this starts to get into going way beyond the energy systems and resource systems to the idea of the embedded energy in creating the materials that we're choosing in the first place. And so I, I think this is kind of the, the positive side of, of this is it's allowing us to deal with issues that are, are fairly complex but actually revealing and creating more transparency than we've ever had before mm -hmm. around the supply chain related to, uh, again, from the built environment standpoint, you know, where did that chair come from and where was this carpet made and those fibers? What did it take in terms of resources to produce them? And maybe really starting to shift toward new choices. So, I mean, again, there is such an incredible positive because of, uh, and I'll go beyond sensors, but around the kind of high-powered computing that is available to us. Yeah. Interesting. Uh, just want, I'm aware that we're uh, almost, we're nudging up uh, against the leading edge of lunch, uh, which is always an exciting prospect. Just want, uh, again, I'm, I'm, I'm always looking for this um, in terms of its applicabil applicability worldwide. I mean, sensing, analysis of it, I think, you know, was, uh, a rich person's 
privilege. I'm just wondering in terms of the technology, uh, the size of it, the, the cost of it, the utility of it, uh, it's all becoming highly more efficient and and accessible to people. Is that is that is that true? And uh, and is there further to go, or or is it still you've got to be pretty serious if you're starting to put in a sensing system for whatever? Just just interested in what that what that that trend has been, or maybe Andrew. Is there... <laughs> I'm struggling to think how to answer you. Because um, yeah, Singapore can probably afford to put in a. Uh, sensing system. Yes, that's probably true. Um, so I take your point on that. But you asked the design of these, I, I guess it's an issue of functionality. What do you, I mean, I think um, Nusha had a very important point about, you know, is this opportunistic? I mean, having cell phones and an ability to measure things as you walk around is fabulous. I mean, um, quite how you use that data in, in an application is, an, is another story. You can learn a lot of things and, and get insight. Uh, but designing systems that are robust and work over time for monitoring and controlling infrastructures, for example, yes, that is still a very elaborate process. The interesting thing about it is we are operating at scales which were inconceivable because the cost of the, the actual technology has come down so much. So what we can do is look at things at much greater temporal scale or spatial scales than ever before. And that certainly gives us an advantage. Um, it's for citywide problems, it enables us to monitor things at city scale, which were just inconceivable some years ago. Mm. A final word from each of you, a message out to us who are trying to make sense of that forward journey around uh, sensing as part of the uh, urban uh, intelligence um, uh, equation and uh, um, suite of, of uh, opportunities that that's providing for those of us either working in city authorities or perhaps those involved in research or in business. If you had an, I was going to say, an, an unexpected message for them, but maybe I won't put too much pressure on you, but a, <laughs> a fresh mes message to take us into a conversation over lunch, what would it be, would it be related to uh, the world of urban sensing? Who wants to start? Sure, I'll, I'll go Diane, first, whatever. Yeah. Um, you know, again, fantastic conversation. Uh, I think there's such opportunity in sensing to be able to understand uh, the, the complex problems that have been hard to solve. Um, and to, to bring that to bear, along with lots of other inputs and conversations and engagement to get to the solution. These are a means to an end, not the end in of themselves. And I, I really believe that, you know, from the design standpoint, that, that we have the opportunity to go beyond precedents of buildings even like this to create uh, places that, again, really do enhance the kind of experiences we're looking to have. Okay, thank you. Um, I'd say, you know, look at, look to unexpected places, moving beyond that opportunistic sensing um, our vision is to build this new public health infrastructure that is you know, giving us an early warning system for infectious disease outbreaks, that is detecting antibiotic resistance genes in communities before um, we're, we're affected, and looking at environmental contaminants uh, in the foods that we eat. Um, but all of that, you know, I want to go back to what Mayor Nenshi said this morning, which you've already said, but I want to say it again because uh, it really resonated with me too. You know, if it's not making cities better, or if it's not making our lives better, then don't do it. Yeah. That's what I was going to end up. I was going to say, <laughs> all the people with the problems define define the problems which will make your cities better. But sensing technology is likely to be in there somewhere. It's already transformed medical imaging through you name different fields. It's now starting to impact us all at city scale. So, I think it really is an exciting time. Mm. Technology is really ready for us. Brilliant. Well, uh, thank you so much uh, for uh, your thoughts and also fascinating work that you're doing. Ladies and gentlemen, our panel on Urban Sensing. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs>